Welcome everyone to the eighth annual Society of Creation Conference, In the Beginning, the Origin of the Universe. Our keynote speaker for this afternoon is Mr. Spike Pissaris. Spike has a degree in electrical engineering and he's done graduate work in physics. For a number of years, he worked in the United States military space program. He has a very interesting story in which when he began his career, he did so as an atheist firmly committed to evolution. But during his time in investigation, he became convinced of the truth of creation, which ultimately led him to the creator. He is going to his first presentation today, and he is doing two of them, is the origin of the solar system. Before I turn it over to Spike, you should know that uh, he's quite a music aficionado. As a matter of fact, Spike is always trying to impress me with his knowledge of music. And he asked me one day, he said, you know, C, E flat, and G walked into a bar. What happened? <laughs> I got him on this one. I said, nothing. Bars can't serve minors. <laughs> I was surprised when I found out that Spike didn't want his children, although he is very musically inclined, didn't want his children participating in band or orchestra. When I asked why, he said, you know, too much sax and violins. Well, I probably should have uh, left with the first one, shouldn't I? So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Spike. Thank you, Dr. Blockware. Let me do the screen thing. That working? Got it. And my audio levels are good? Yes, it's good. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for attending and I'm grateful for the privilege of speaking here. Um, there might be a little bit of apprehension because you just heard that I have an engineering degree and obviously engineers are not necessarily known for being charismatic communicators. Uh, in fact, here's a tip if you're dealing with engineers. Do you know how you can tell if you are speaking to an extroverted engineer? It's because when he speaks to you, he looks at your shoes instead of his own. So hopefully that's a helpful tip sometimes and could explain a few things. Uh, my time here today, I have two presentations, as Dr. Locklear just said. My first talk will be on the solar system. I had the privilege of speaking on this today. And in the question of origins, uh, much focus is usually given to questions like neo-Darwinian evolution and biology, those sorts of things here on Earth. It's not as commonly talked about uh, the broader question of our solar system, our universe, and so on. So I'm thankful that our conference here uh, is focusing on these topics because they tend to be rather underrepresented, I think, at least in the origins discussion. But there's much indeed that we can talk about. This is a very rich field of study for us. Uh, our solar system, for example, is the location where our Earth is located. And we've explored a lot of it and have learned a lot about it. And what can we see about and what can we learn about origins from studying uh, the solar system that we live in? Well, first of all, what is the solar system? I'm showing you a diagram here of the solar system. This is to scale for size, but not for distance. So this is a good depiction of how these objects are in relation to each other as far as size, but in the actual solar system, they're much farther away from each other than you see here. So the solar system uh, is basically named after our sun because the Latin name for the sun is Sol. Thus, the solar system is the system of everything that orbits our sun. And of course, the sun itself is included as well. So where did this system come from? Well, there's a couple of possible explanations. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And hopefully we're familiar with this verse. Uh, this would confirm for us that the heavens and everything that the heavens contain, which of course would include the solar system, was indeed created by the Lord. Of course, this, this explanation is not popular in our culture today. Uh, we are told that the secular model is the correct way of looking at things. And by far the consensus secular model for the origin of the solar system today is known as the solar nebula model. The idea that everything came from a solar nebula, a large cloud of gas and dust, roughly four and a half billion years ago. And the story goes something like this. In the beginning, there was gas. 
that gas began to collapse under gravity and began to swirl. As it did so, dust grains condensed out of the gas, forming small particles. The small particles stuck together to become little rocks. The little rocks stuck together to become bigger rocks. The bigger rocks stuck together to become what are known as planetesimals, uh, basically asteroids. And then those planetesimals, those asteroids, stuck together and interacted in various ways to form the planets that we see today. Now, we are told that this is a good scientific model and that it explains very well the origin of the solar system and the planets within it. But how do we know if an, a proposed explanation like this is good? How do we know if a model of origins is good in this case? Well, there's a, several criteria we could use. Number one, when we look at an object in the solar system, is it consistent with the model? Is it consistent with the predictions of the model? Number two is, does this object really look like the outcome, the product of random processes? Uh, the solar nebula model explicitly says, you know, there's no creator. This is just the laws of physics working themselves out over time. That being the case, when we look at various things in the solar system and even elsewhere in the cosmos, do they look like just the product of the laws of physics working themselves out? Or do some of them uh, manifest specific design features being finely tuned and being very unlikely to have arisen from random processes? Uh, I'm going to talk more about this in my second talk here this afternoon. Um, I'll touch on it a little bit within the solar system as well. And the third question is, do these objects really look billions of years old? Uh, if the model says they, they're, that they are billions of years old, but there's reason to not believe that, well, then that would tell us that that model is not actually a good explanation. So let's discuss each planet in the solar system and compare them to, um, the, especially the solar nebula model, and see if this claimed explanation for the solar system really withstands scrutiny as we look at the actual evidence. So we're going to work our way out from inwards to outwards, um, starting from closest to the sun, we have the planet Mercury, and then Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and then as you probably know, Pluto got demoted a while back, so it's not considered a planet anymore, but we are going to work Pluto into the discussion too. So looking at each of these objects, starting with Mercury, what can we tell? Well, Mercury is the first of the four terrestrial planets. Uh, that's Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, as you see here. And terrestrial refers to the Latin name for Earth, which is Terra. And since the Earth is a rocky planet, and the other, these other three planets are as well, they are known as the terrestrial planets. So looking at Mercury, there's several interesting things that we have learned about it, some of which uh, occurred even just recently as our spacecraft have explored them. One surprise when we first started investigating and exploring Mercury is that Mercury turns out to be very dense. Uh, apparently there's an iron core occupying about three quarters of its volume. So Mercury is basically a big ball of iron surrounded by a thin layer of rock on top. Now this is interesting because that solar nebula model actually says Mercury can't be that dense. Uh, the model can't account for a planet like Mercury existing as the product of that solar nebula and the formation processes within it. So for those who wish to ac accept the solar nebula model as being correct, obviously this creates a bit of a problem. This planet doesn't match the model. Well, what is a problem? You need a solution. The so proposed solution for this is that Mercury formed uh, in a, uh, with a less dense composition, which that model would uh, be more consistent with, but then early on in solar system history, a planetesimal, an asteroid, crashed into Mercury, broke it up into pieces. The lighter pieces went off into space, never to return, and the heavier pieces stayed behind and coalesced into the planet that we see today. Now, one can ask, is there any evidence for this, for this collision having happened? And the answer is no, other than the fact that if this collision hadn't happened, uh, the planet doesn't match the secular origins model. So you can decide for yourself if this is really a strong piece of evidence or not, or if it's more of a um, question begging going on. So there's not really evidence for the collision. There is, however, evidence against this collision. For example, we have found that there's sulfur on the surface of Mercury. Now, why is that significant? Well, at room temperature, sulfur is this yellow crystalline material that you see here. Sulfur turns out to be very volatile. It boils away, turns into vapor at a fairly low temperature compared to some other elements. And it turns out that it is actually too volatile to have survived this collision. Uh, a collision like this sufficient to break up the, the precursor to mercury into all those pieces, which then coalesced back together. Uh, this would have been a very violent and hot event. Uh, 
volatile elements like sulfur would have been vaporized during this collision, they wouldn't be on Mercury today had this collision actually happened. But of course, sulfur is there today. And an additional problem with this is sulfur shouldn't be on Mercury anyway, set aside the whole question of a collision. The solar nebula model makes predictions about what uh, or which elements can condense out of the cloud at certain distances from the proto-sun, the sun that's forming in the center. Uh, it's, it's obvious, of course, that the closer you are to the sun, the warmer it is in this gas cloud. Well, uh, something at Mercury's neighborhood would be, would be too hot, that part of the gas cloud would be too hot for a volatile element like sulfur to have condensed out of it. So this model actually predicts sulfur shouldn't be on Mercury anyway, yet we know that it is. Mercury has an, uh, some additional issues as well, one of which is that it has a magnetic field. And Dr. Humphreys has spoken about this. Um, and he spent a lot of time on this, and I apologize if um, I don't want to seem like I'm belaboring the point. But this is actually an important topic throughout the solar system. So I'm going to revisit it here again briefly. There's two basic sources for planetary magnetism. Uh, option number one is a dynamo, basically an electric generator going on inside the planet. Now, a dynamo could, in theory, last a long time and produce a magnetic field for a long time for a planet. Now I say in theory because as we'll discuss later, there's actually large problems even constructing a dynamo theory that works at all. Um, but the idea at least is that a dynamo could be self-perpetuating and last for billions of years. The issue with mercury though is that this requires a molten core. You need currents, uh, fluid flow of molten of liquid metal inside of the planet for a dynamo to be possible. So that's option number one for magnetic field. Option number two is remnant or residual magnetism. Uh, this is magnetism that is left over from a planet's formation. Now this too is a valid option for producing a magnetic field. The issue with it, however, is that it will decay over time and it will not last, therefore, a very long time, certainly not for billions of years as the secular model would expect. So if you are a secular modeler and you believe in the billions of years, Remnant magnetism is not an option for you because it would have been gone eons ago. You have to think that when you see a magnetic field, you have to think it's actually coming from a dynamo. But as I said, a dynamo requires a molten core. So therefore, when you see a planet like Mercury, you would expect Mercury does not have a magnetic field today because it is a small planet. And as a small planet, its core should have frozen solid eons ago. Small objects cool off faster than larger objects. Mercury being as small as it is, should have cooled off and frozen solid eons ago. Therefore, there should be no dynamo inside of this planet. Therefore, if you're thinking in terms of billions of years, it can't have a magnetic field today. But it does have a magnetic field. But if it's not a dynamo, what would it therefore be coming from? Well, it would be coming from remnant magnetism. But as I said before, remnant magnetism can't last very long. That would tell us that this planet is actually young. Now, secular modelers are, of course, aware of this problem. Uh, they propose a solution that there is sulfur mixed in with Mercury's core, which would allow it uh, to not freeze over time. Therefore, it could still stay molten. Therefore, it could still be making a dynamo. The problem with this is, as I mentioned, sulfur shouldn't actually be part of this planet had it come from that solar nebula. So the only proposed solution to this problem is actually something that contradicts the predictions of the model that it's meant to save. There's more that we could talk about Mercury if we wanted to take the time to do so. Um, one last item that I will mention is that, uh, as I mentioned back here, whoops, back here, remnant magnetism will actually decay. Now that's interesting because the MESSENGER spacecraft, as Dr. Humphreys has said, actually has measured that the field is decaying. And he predicted this actually back in 1984 in, con uh, in consistency with his biblical model of how magnetic fields are produced. So again, we're seeing evidence that the, this magnetism is remnant, not coming from a dynamo. And again, this would confirm a young age for this planet. Moving outwards in the solar system, we come to the planet Venus. Now Venus is covered in very thick clouds, uh, makes uh, actually the atmosphere is opaque from Earth. So we can't see through the clouds. Uh, the clouds do have an interesting effect. Uh, it, has caused apparently a runaway greenhouse effect on Venus. I'm going to talk more about this in my next presentation. But once we started visiting with spacecraft and the Soviet Union actually even landed several spacecraft on the surface, we discovered that Venus's surface is very young. 
there's a distinct lack of chemical weathering and cratering and other things we would expect to see if this planet was actually billions of years old. Instead, the surface looks young and fresh. Now, what do I mean by young? Well, the secular modelers will say it's uh, up to 500 million years old. Now, that's a long time, but it's also not an absolute age measurement. It's up to 500 million years, not exactly 500 million years. Uh, I would affirm, as would many others, that it's actually much younger than that. Even setting aside that issue, there's a interesting thing going on here. They claim it's half a, or 500 million years old, which is half of a billion. Well, the planet itself is supposed to be four and a half billion. So even with their explanation for this, they're still missing four billion years of its alleged history. Now they would claim well, that the planet itself is four and a half billion years old. It's just the outer surface that's young. Well, the outer surface is the only part that we can see. So if we're going to base our scientific models on observational evidence, then uh, that should be, play a large role in our understanding of where a planet came from. And Venus is often called our sister planet. Uh, on the left there, this is what it looks like without the clouds, by the way. So we're seeing the surface here. Now, being called our sister planet because it's roughly the same size, it's the same mass composition as the Earth, and it's our next door neighbor here in the solar system. So this planet supposedly formed at the same time in the same place uh, from the same natural processes from the same materials as the Earth did. Therefore, in its major characteristics, it should be the same as Earth. But Earth has a moon, Venus does not. Why does this planet not have a moon if it really formed, as I said, uh, the same way the Earth did, the same time, the same place, and all the rest of it? Well, some secular folks have uh, explained this by saying, well, Venus did actually form with the moon, as the model would seem to imply. Uh, but then something happened. An asteroid came along, a planetesimal, and smashed into that moon and destroyed it, and the pieces went away into space, and that's why there's no moon there today. Now, is there any evidence for this collision? Well, no. The pieces are all gone now. So again, we're starting to ask questions about when do we veer from a scientific explanation and more into storytelling after the fact. Moving outwards in the solar system, we have the planet Earth. Now, Earth, of course, is our home. There's a lot we could say about the Earth, and I'm going to spend more time on this in my second presentation. Uh, in this presentation, let's talk about the Earth as a planet. Well, the Earth is uniquely designed for life, as I will talk about next time. Uh, and one of the important aspects of it for us is that the Earth has a magnetic field. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's two possible sources for magnetism for a planet. Is it from a dynamo inside the planet, which could be old in theory, or is it a remnant magnetic field, which would require the planet to be young? Well, as I mentioned with Mercury, dynamo theories actually don't work. Um, history of dynamo theories and showing that not only did they not work today, they've never worked. Uh, the initial idea when it was first proposed was simple, and then people realized it wouldn't actually, couldn't actually work that way. And so they've modified the theory again and again. It's become more and more complicated over time. But the one thing that's remained consistent over time is that none of the theories have actually been successful in explaining how a planet could perpetually produce and maintain a magnetic field over billions of years. In fact, it doesn't look like the Earth has maintained the same magnetic field for billions of years because our magnetic field is decaying. It is fading away and losing energy over time. This, again, would be consistent with it being a remnant field and therefore the planet itself being young. Is there a way to figure out how old the Earth is based on this fact? Actually, yes, there is. Our magnetic field is related to the electric currents being, uh, or that are circulating inside of the Earth. And those are related in turn to the amount of heat inside the Earth, the interior heat of our planet. So the magnetism that we measure on the surface, therefore gives us a rough indicator of the heat inside the planet. Now, the magnetic field, as I said, and Dr. Humphreys has said, is decaying over time. Well, that being the case, if we look backwards in time, it used to be stronger. And since it's um, related to the amount of heat inside the Earth, that means a stronger magnetic field in the past means more interior heat of the Earth in the past. Now, is there a hard limit as to how much heat there, there could have been in the Earth? And the answer is yes. Well, we can figure out how much heat uh, would be inside the planet to melt the Earth's crust. 
Now, since there's no evidence that the crust has ever melted like that, uh, we can say that's a limit to how much heat there ever could have been, and therefore how strong the magnetic field ever could have been. And that would in turn give us uh, a measurement of the maximum age of the Earth. And the answer there is about 20,000 years, even a little bit less than that. Now, again, this is not saying that the Earth is 20,000 years. That's a maximum age. Uh, 6,000 years works just fine. What doesn't work very well is four and a half billion years because that's not consistent with the behavior of the magnetic field that we are measuring and have been doing for over 100 years now. Another noticeable feature of our planet is that 70% of its surface is covered with water. Very essential to life, of course, and I'll talk more about this in my second presentation. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the solar nebula model says that there is no water on Earth. There can't be any water here because in our location in the solar system, the solar nebula was too hot for water to have condensed out of the cloud. It could only have done that farther out in the solar system, but not here. Now, there can be liquid water on Earth today, of course, because the cloud is gone and temperatures are lower than they were back then. But the solar nebula model says the Earth could not have formed with water on it. So the Earth, therefore, a straightforward prediction of this model, would have no water today. But of course, it does have water today and lots of it. So where did this water come from? Well, it had to come later. This is called the late veneer theory, that water was delivered to Earth uh, quite some time after it had formed. And for quite some time, people invoked comets as an explanation for how the water got here. Comets are, of course, big, dirty snowballs out in space, and so it seemed reasonable to some people to propose that hundreds of millions of comets bombarded the Earth after it had formed and thus supplied all of its water. The problem with this explanation is that we have been measuring the composition of comets, and it turns out that they have too much deuterium in them to explain uh, Earth's water. Specifically, the Earth's oceans contain about half of the deuterium that comets do. That being the case, you can't say comets produced uh, Earth's ocean water. Therefore, for quite some time, um, there was no actual viable explanation for how the Earth got its water, because the solar nebula model says it shouldn't have any, and where else could it have come from? Well, this creates a problem. And the proposed solution to this problem today is that asteroids, planetesimals in that uh, nebula cloud, delivered Earth's water sometime uh, later after the Earth had formed. Well, there's a couple issues here. Uh, number one is how much water does an asteroid contain? Not a whole lot, really. Some types of asteroids contain more than others, but Subsequent investigation has shown that although asteroids do match the deuterium in the Earth's oceans better than comets do, they actually have other inconsistencies with ocean water with other elements that they contain. So asteroids actually don't, and I should be more, more precise, planetesimals uh, don't appear to be a viable candidate for the source of Earth's water either. And by the way, when an asteroid crashes into our planet, this is a very violent event. I mean, this can be the equivalent of several million nuclear bombs going off all at once. Even whatever water they did contain would be vaporized in these collisions. This is not a good way to deliver water to a planet with these violent catastrophic events. So a straightforward implication then of the solar nebula model would say that the Earth doesn't have, can't have any water on it today. So the fact that our planet is 70% covered with the stuff, and by the way, there's even more than that inside the mantle of our planet, is a real problem for the model. Looking outwards a little bit further, we see the moon. So important and um, visible to us. I'll talk more about the moon in my second presentation, but uh, what I want to focus on during this talk is the origin of the moon. Now, the moon, of course, is unique in that it's the only celestial body other than the Earth that people have walked on. And why did they go walk on it? Well, uh, reason number one was to beat the Soviet Union there. Uh, reason number two was to resolve a big argument that was going on about the moon's origin. Second, the modelers at the time had three competing explanations for where the moon came from, the fission theory, the nebula theory, and the capture theory. And I'm not going to go into details about this because the Apollo astronauts brought back hundreds of pounds of samples with them, soil, rocks, and so on, and it turns out that the samples, when they were analyzed, discredited all three of those theories in different ways. So for, for some time then, secular modelers were left without an explanation for where the moon could have come from. This creates a problem. And when there's a problem, you need a solution. So the solution, if you look this up in the textbooks today or science media programs or whatever, you'll be told that the Earth formed without a moon and then 
early on in solar system history, a very large planetesimal or asteroid, uh, something the size of Mars, in fact, came along and hit Earth and caused a big debris cloud. Uh, some of the debris came back to Earth, but the rest of it coalesced into the moon, and that's where the moon came from. Well, even when this explanation was first proposed, a lot of people um, saw problems with it. Uh, first of all, it's a rather contrived explanation. Um, it doesn't even uh, seem feasible unless the impactor came in at exactly the right angle and exactly the right velocity, and even then there's questions about whether or not this would work. But other evidence, even after that, has arisen against this idea. For example, in the, mid, uh, uh, in the middle of the first decade of the 2000s, some scientists uh, thought, you know, it's been quite some time now since we analyzed the samples that the astronauts brought back from the moon. You know, lab technology is better now than it was back then, so maybe we should go back and look again and see if there's anything in those samples that the first round of analysis missed. And sure enough, it was discovered that in some of the soil samples, uh, like those collect being collected here by Harris and Schmidt on the surface of the moon, in some of those soil samples, there was uh, amounts of water. And significantly, these soil samples were volcanic glasses. Now, why is that important? Well, if you just take soil from the surface of the moon and find water in it, that doesn't really necessarily tell you that the moon itself has water in it because the soil could have, you know, on the surface, could have come from a meteorite or a comet or something else hitting the moon after it was formed. But volcanic glasses did come from the moon's interior, and therefore, if there's water in those samples, that means there's water inside the moon as well. And that's significant because if this had happened, there would not be any water inside the moon because this would have been a violent catastrophic collision, hot enough to vaporize whatever water was present. The inside of the moon would be dry today, but apparently it is not because we have found that there's water inside of these volcanic glasses. And this analysis, uh, by the way, was first published in 2008, and subsequent work has confirmed it. So it's been known since 2008 that this idea has major problems with it. Yet this is still being uh, touted as the correct explanation for where the moon came from. And why, is, why are they touting a model that um, many argue has fatal problems and can't actually be true? Well, because no one really has a viable alternative to it. So they're um, teaching and touting this one, even though, again, many argue that it doesn't actually work. I don't think that's a good approach to science education. I think that if you don't have a valid solution to a problem, you should just say so. But people continue to argue about this. Another reason that the astronauts went to the moon, at least uh, the motivation of some, was to measure the age of the moon. And the question is, is the moon really 4 billion years old? Uh, as the current model, the impact of model, would say. Well, the Apollo astronauts brought a lot of ex uh, experiments and equipment up there with them. And if you look behind uh, this one here, you will see a piece of gear on the ground back there. Here's a close up of it. This is an LLR reflector. LLR means lunar laser ranging. Basically, it's a, it's a sophisticated kind of reflector uh, that bounces light back in the same direction that it came from. And there are several of these on the moon right now. Uh, the Apollo 11, 14, and 15 missions. Uh, left these reflectors behind, and the Soviet Union actually did uh, something similar with the Luna 17 and 21 missions. And scientists are able to fire lasers at these things from Earth, and if they hit them, which as you can imagine is difficult, but they are able to do this, uh, if they hit them, the laser bounces directly back to them. And so you can measure how long it takes the light to get from Earth to the moon and back, and that gives you a very precise measurement of how far away from the Earth the moon is at that moment in time. And these experiments have been going on since the early 70s. So uh, we have now several decades of data built up for measurements of the moon's distance. And this has confirmed something that was already suspected at the time the astronauts went up there. And that is that the moon is actually moving away from the Earth over time. It is receding from the Earth. So why is this happening? Well, I'm going to provide a little detail here um, as to what's going on. So in this graphic, you see the moon moving around the Earth. You see the Earth's ocean water actually bulging toward the moon because of the moon's gravitational pull on it. Now, we experience this as tides. Um, what's not shown in the graphic here is the Earth rotating. If you imagine the Earth spinning underneath of that bulge, then, and again, this is, we will be spinning a lot faster than the moon itself is moving around in this graphic here. 
uh, we actually move into a tidal bulge and then back out of it. So on Earth, we experience this as the tide coming in and the tide coming out. But what's really happening is you're, we're moving into a bulge of ocean water and then back out of it again. Now, because the Earth is rotating underneath the bulge, the bulge actually gets pulled forward a little bit relative to the moon because there's a little bit of friction on the ocean floors. So the ocean bulge is actually offset a bit um, and compared to the moon, and it actually pulls the moon forward in its orbit because that big mass of water has a gravitational effect of its own. So when you pull something forward in its orbit, you're adding energy to it, and that object will then move away farther from you over time. Now, I know that was kind of a complicated explanation, and if it didn't make sense to you, um, don't worry about it. The key point is we understand uh, the mechanism for the moon moving away, and this was actually understood even before the Apollo missions happened. The only unknown was how quickly was it happening. And we have now confirmed that the moon is moving away from the Earth at about an inch and a half per year today. Now, that's not very much in over 6,000 years of history. That uh, is not very significant. Um, even at the beginning of time, the moon was not that much closer to the Earth. However, if you believe that this system is four and a half billion years old, then there's a big problem because if you do the math, this effect would have been stronger and more pronounced the closer that the moon was to the Earth. In other words, earlier in time, the recession rate would have been higher. That's because of the way gravity works. And you can do the math here and figure out that the moon would have been touching the Earth just one and a half billion years ago. Because if it's moving away today, then if you look backwards in time, it used to be closer, right? Well, look back into time one and a half billion years, it would have been touching the Earth. Now, obviously, that never happened. I mean, nobody in this origins discussion would believe that that had happened. Um, but I'm presenting that to show you that this system cannot have been here evolving, quote unquote, for the four plus billion years that the secular modelers want. Now, note also that I'm not saying the system is one and a half billion years old. That's a maximum age for this system. I mean, 6,000 years works just fine. What doesn't work is over four billion years, which is what the secular model says. So indeed, the Earth-Moon system is not 4.6 billion years old. Uh, the Earth isn't, and the Moon isn't either. Moving on in the solar system, we have the planet Mars. So what can we learn about Mars and uh, discuss in terms of the origin debate? Well, Mars is a desert planet. It, uh, the surface looks something like this, depending on where you are. I mean, there's different kinds of features, mountains, volcanoes, canyons, but this is basically what the surface looks like. Why does it look like this? Well, because Mars has a very thin atmosphere, so it cannot retain liquid water. The thin atmosphere means that the boiling point of water is very low. So even though it's very cold on Mars, uh, if you poured out some water onto the surface, it would boil away in a fairly short time. So the thin atmosphere means Mars cannot retain liquid water for any appreciable length of time. Now, it, there's frozen water there, as you see uh, in the polar ice caps, but liquid water, uh, no. However, if you follow news and uh, science media, you'll be aware that there are many people who want to believe and talk about there having been a global ocean covering Mars in the deep past, that Mars used to be flooded with water. Well, as I just said, that's impossible today um, because the atmosphere is too thin and couldn't retain water. So this creates a problem. Well, what is the problem you need? A solution. So the solution to this problem is that Mars had a thicker atmosphere in the past, and which would allow it to retain the global ocean that many people would like to see confirmed as being fact. Uh, but then a planetesimal, an asteroid, hit the planet and changed it in such a way that the atmosphere was stripped away, and then it lost the ocean as well, leaving behind the desert planet that we see today. Now, again, is there any evidence for this collision? Well, I will leave that to you to um, delineate whether or not this is a very scientific explanation or not. I will note one inconsistency here. On the left, we have the Earth. On the right, we have Mars. Uh, this is not to scale, by the way. Mars is actually much smaller than the Earth. On the left, we have a planet that's 70% covered in water and has a lot more water in the mantle as well. We are told, however, that a global flood on Earth is not a viable scientific explanation, despite abundant geological evidence for that having happened. On the right, we have a planet that's a desert planet today where liquid water cannot be retained on the surface, yet we are told that there did used to be a global flood on that planet. So I see some inconsistency here in the approaches that some people take to these questions. 
So that concludes our discussion for this presentation on the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Moving outwards in the solar system, we come to the gas giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And you can see the Earth compared to those four. Of course, the Earth is much smaller than all of them. The largest planet in the solar system is Jupiter. Jupiter is famous for, among other things, it's a great red spot. This is a large storm system that's larger than the entire Earth. Uh, imagine a hurricane larger than the Earth and how violent of a storm that would be. This has actually been on Jupiter's surface for as long as we've had telescopes to look at it, so at least 400 years. Uh, maybe it's been there since creation for all we know. So Jupiter is a planet of extremes and a lot of very dramatic features. However, it also has many beneficial features. For example, it provides protection for the Earth. Jupiter is a very large object, has a significant gravitational effect on its surroundings, and it actually pulls toward itself comets and asteroids and other things coming into the solar system that might otherwise have hit the Earth. And what I'm showing you here is actually a scar on Jupiter. Uh, it wasn't there for very long. Um, so maybe scar is not a good word, but the, <laughs> the uh, effect of an impact of a comet that actually hit Jupiter. So we've actually seen things coming into the solar system, some of which uh, under other circumstances might have hit the Earth, but Jupiter pulls them in and either flings them out of the solar system completely or else they hit Jupiter. In either case, it serves a protective effect for us. When it comes to the question of origins, well, Jupiter displays a lot of beauty. Now, beauty is a very subjective thing, of course, um, but we can at least appreciate the handiwork of our creator in this planet and in the others as well. When it comes to origins models, we can discuss something called the migration problem. Jupiter suffers from this problem. What, what does this mean? Well, it turns out that as Jupiter uh, would have been forming in this alleged gas cloud four and a half billion years ago, as this planet was growing, it's gathering material toward itself and getting bigger and bigger. But what is it moving around within? Well, it's moving around within a giant cloud of gas. So plowing into a cloud of gas is basically a headwind that's going to slow a planet like Jupiter down as it's moving around. And the way orbits work is when you slow down, you move inwards towards the object that you're orbiting. And studies have shown that Jupiter, as it was trying, quote unquote, trying to form within this gas cloud, actually would have spiraled all the way inwards to the sun. As this press release from astronomy and astrophysics points out, theories predict that the giant protoplanets protoplanet meaning a new planet trying to form, will merge into the central star. That's a nice way of saying crash into the sun before planets have time to form. This makes it very difficult to understand how they can form at all. Understanding the formation of giant planets is currently one of the major challenges for astronomers. Well, it's more than just a major challenge. I mean, a straightforward implication of the model is that this planet shouldn't actually be there. But of course it is. There's more we could talk about Jupiter as a planet, but I just want to spend a moment and mention that it also has some wonderful moons as well. For example, this is Io, or Eo, depending on how you want to pronounce that. <laughs> There's different camps on this question too. Uh, Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. Very violent uh, volcanoes. Every time our spacecraft has flown by, we've seen um, one or more volcanoes going off, spewing material, in some cases, up to 180 miles into space. And the material flooding the surface is significant also. We've seen volcanic eruptions on Io that have created its equivalent of lava flows uh, the size of the state of Arizona in a very short period of time. So massive amounts of material are coming out of Io's volcanoes, more or less continuously. The question is, what is the source of heat for this violent geological activity? Well, a lot of it is coming from tidal flexing. Basically, Io is caught in a gravitational tug of war between Jupiter on one side and the other moons of Jupiter on the other. And so this is squeezing and flexing Io in the middle of all that. And so this is imparting energy into this moon and that is the source of some of this heat. Uh, the problem is it doesn't account for all of the heat. We've calculated how much heat this requires and the flexing doesn't produce all that is necessary. Another source of the heat of heat would be primordial heat left over from Io's formation. Uh, the issue here, though, is that if Io was actually four and a half billion years old, then primordial heat would have dissipated a long time ago. Now, if it was created recently, that could explain why there's still primordial heat there. So as creationists, we would have an explanation, a full explanation for the source of this heat, 
or as people who believe in the billions of years uh, actually have a problem here. Moreover, if you believe in billions of years for this moon's age, then there's another issue. If you measure the amount of material coming out of Io's volcanoes and do the math here over four and a half billion years, Io would have actually produced 40 times its own mass through its own volcanoes. Uh, put another way, it would have recycled itself entirely 40 times in four and a half billion years through its own volcanoes. Now, is that a reasonable thing to say has been happening? Uh, I would argue no. In fact, there's a uh, related issue here. If there, this violent geological activity has been going on to this extent for four and a half billion years, it certainly would have formed a low density crust on this moon by now because high density material sinks and low density material rises. Therefore, Io should have a low density crust, which among other things would um, mitigate some of this volcanic activity. Um, but the activity continues and there's other evidence that says this low density crust has not formed yet. That's an argument for this moon being very young and not four and a half billion years old. Jupiter has some other interesting moons as well, but let's move on in our time today and talk about Saturn briefly. Saturn, of course, is famous for its beautiful rings. Uh, the rings look like solid things, but they're actually just belts of particles all orbiting the planet together. And the rings are not very thick. Uh, if you built a scale model of Saturn, the size of a city like San Francisco, say, uh, the, the rings would actually be the thickness of a sheet of paper. So very, very thin rings compared to the bulk of the planet itself. So how can we see from so far away these very, very thin uh, rings? Well, the answer is that they're very bright and that's why they reflect sunlight back to Earth. And that's how we can see them. Well, the brightness actually creates a challenge if you wanna believe in the billions of years. Um, this was an ongoing debate for quite some time, but it was finally resolved recently. It turns out that these rings would actually darken significantly over time. Uh, and therefore, if they were old, they would be dark today. But they're not dark today, they're still very bright. That means these rings are actually very young. And even the secular folks have conceded um, this debate. This raises a second question then. Well, it was argued for a long time that the rings must have formed at the same time Saturn did from the cloud of gas and dust and all the rest of it. Uh, if the rings are actually young, then they didn't form back then because they only formed recently. So what then is the source of these rings? Well, this creates a bit of a head scratcher, a problem for modelers. And the, uh, of course, when there's a problem, you need, if my mouse would work here, a solution. The Possible explanation for this is that Saturn formed without rings until fairly recently in astronomical time, until an asteroid came along and hit one of the moons or something that's not there anymore, and all the particles made the beautiful rings that we see today. Maybe a better explanation for this is that they were created just to be beautiful as evidence of our Lord's design and handiwork. As a planet, uh, Saturn speaks to the origins question in the similar way that Jupiter does because it too suffers from the migration problem. It too would have migrated all the way inwards through the gas cloud until it crashed into the sun early on in solar system history. So along with Jupiter, Saturn too shouldn't be there according to this model. Saturn has an, uh, dozens of moons. Let's talk about just a few of them here, some really interesting ones. This is Enceladus, a pretty little moon and the brightest object in the solar system actually, because it reflects back into space almost all of the uh, light that it receives from the sun. Now, when we first started looking at Enceladus, there were some interesting questions that arose. For example, this photograph here, those are Saturn's rings across the middle of the photograph. Enceladus is below them. And hopefully on your screen, you can see there's a little smudge below Enceladus. What is going on there? What is that smudge? Well, it turns out Enceladus has geysers of water and ice, you know, fountains basically, coming out of its south pole. Enceladus is a very geologically active moon. Now, here's the problem. Enceladus is not a large object. If it formed billions of years ago, it should have cooled off a long, long time ago. It shouldn't have any heat left over from its formation, which would indicate it shouldn't be geologically active today, but it is still active today. Now, the explanation that is given for this is that Enceladus, just like Io, is um, being caught in tidal flexing. That Saturn on one side and moons on the other side are pulling in opposite directions gravitationally. And so Enceladus is being squeezed and flexed in the middle. And that's kind of pumping some geological energy into this moon, which is being manifested as these eruptions. 
Well, it's true that there is some of that going on, but calculations show this is only a few percent of the, necess the, the energy necessary to explain this geological activity. So if you believe that Enceladus is billions of years old, you have a problem explaining how it can still be doing this today because it shouldn't have the energy to be doing this anymore. Now, if Enceladus were just thousands of years old, created recently, then this isn't a problem because it's still be cool, it could still be cooling off from its formation just thousands of years ago. That would explain the energy and what we see. So if, there's, if Enceladus is thousands of years old, this isn't a problem. If it's billions of years old, then this is a problem. And similar arguments can be made for Titan, which, as you might guess by the name, is the largest of Saturn's moons and is actually uh, even larger than the planet Mercury. Uh, Titan, as you can see from this photograph here, looks fuzzy. That's because it actually has an atmosphere. Now, the atmosphere is opaque from Earth, so we can't see the surface from here. But what we can do is measure the sunlight reflecting back from the atmosphere. And from that, we can measure its composition and uh, other things. And it turns out that Titan has a lot of methane in its atmosphere. Now, this is interesting because sunlight breaks methane down. And then the constituent chemicals that are formed, uh, some of them condense back into ethane and rain down on the surface. So the process is sunlight breaks down methane, which produces ethane, which rains down on the surface. And people calculated, number one, that the methane would only last about 10 million years. Uh, now, that sounds like a long time, and it is a long time, but it's nothing compared to the four and a half billion years that Titan is supposed to be. Uh, put another way, the the methane in Titan's atmosphere should have been used up 4.59 billion years ago, uh, but it's still there today, which would seem to indicate that it's actually very young. Furthermore, people said, well, if this has been going on for four and a half billion years, then there should be a large reservoir of ethane, liquid ethane, built up on the surface of Titan from all these billions of years of methane being broken down. So before our spacecraft arrived and started looking at this closely, it was predicted by some secular folks that there would be a global ocean of ethane on Titan, roughly a kilometer or so deep. So we're talking two thirds of a mile, more or less. The problem is when the Cassini spacecraft arrived and sent down the Huygens lander, uh, it did not find the global ocean of methane and ethane that was expected. This is a photograph sent back from the surface of Titan by the lander, which landed on dry ground. There is no global ocean there. Now, if Titan were only thousands of years old, this makes perfect sense. There hasn't been enough time for a significant amount of ethane to build up on the surface. So if this is thousands of years old, no problem. This explains what we see. But if it's billions of years old, then there's a real challenge trying to explain what's going on here because Titan looks very young as a result of this. And there's actually other reasons to believe that the moons of Saturn are young, and I'm not gonna take the time to talk about that here today. I will, um, limit my discussion of Saturn to one more item, and that's these two little moons called Janus and Epimetheus. These are sometimes called the dancing moons of Saturn. Now, on the left, you see Saturn's rings. On the right, you see these two moons. These are orbiting uh, Saturn very closely together. And it's interesting because um, the way orbits work is the closer, you're to the, uh, closer you are to the object you're orbiting, the faster your speed is. So these two objects are orbiting side by side. The one on the inside, of course, is moving a little bit faster because as I said, the way orbits work. So over time, the one on the inside is outpacing the one on the outside. Eventually, as they go around, the one on the inside will catch up to the one on the outside. Now this takes several years, um, but it'll happen eventually. And when it does, these two objects start pulling on each other gravitationally. The one on the outside pulls the one on the inside outwards, and the one on the inside pulls the one on the outside, <laughs> the one on the inside pulls the one on the outside inwards. So they're pulling on each other and they wind up swapping positions. The one on the inside moves to the outside, the one on the outside moves to the inside, and then the whole cycle repeats. The one on the inside moves faster, eventually catches up to the other one from behind after a few years, and then they swap places again. This has to be precisely balanced in order to keep working. Now, does this look like the result of random processes? Um, would we expect such a thing to happen just on its own? Or would a better explanation be that there is a designer here, perhaps with a little bit of a sense of humor and a wink, setting things up like this that we didn't even know was there until after almost 6,000 years of human history. Moving outwards in the solar system, we come to the planet Uranus. Now looking at Uranus uh, in a telescope or even in a closer photo as you see here, 
it's kind of a nondescript bland bluish greenish ball. Uh, big surprise then when we got close enough to really take good measurements of it and this false color photograph uh, on the right shows the location of the poles on Uranus. So you might expect that the, the, the North Pole would be on the top and the South Pole would be in the bottom. That's not how Uranus is. The poles are actually sticking out of the side as you see over on the right here. Uh, in fact, that pole, that the orange circle representing uh, the pole, is that a North Pole or a South Pole? I'm not really even sure how you would decide that question because the question <laughs> as posed doesn't make a whole lot of sense in this configuration. Basically, instead of spinning like a top as it goes around the sun like all the other planets do, Uranus rolls along sideways like a ball. Now, this is not what the secular model predicts. The secular model predicts all the planets will spin like tops. Uranus doesn't do that. This creates a problem. And when there's a problem, you need a solution. So the preferred explanation for this is that Uranus formed spinning like, like a top, like the model actually predicts, and then something crashed into it and knocked it over, which is why it rolls along sideways now instead. Problem with this explanation, number one, is that it requires a large impactor to do it. Uh, number two, there's no evidence of it having happened. Uranus's orbit is very circular today. We would expect it to have been dis affected somewhat by such a violent collision. Another problem is that Uranus has a, a nice system of moons orbiting its equator uh, perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic. So that system of moons doesn't match this explanation either. Perhaps someone created it that way just to make it uh, different than all the other planets and maybe even cause planets for those who wish to deny his Andy work today. I mentioned a moment ago that Uranus has a number of moons. Uh, one of the one of the fun ones, in my opinion, is this little moon here called Miranda. Not a very big object, but look at how distinct and how varied all the various pieces of its terrain are. I mean, how many different kinds of terrain can you identify on this little moon that's only a few hundred miles across? It has some of the most um, pronounced topography in the whole solar system. Uh, this here looks like someone swiped a big paintbrush across the surface almost. <clears throat> Excuse me. And notice how distinct the uh, boundary is between this part of the terrain and the other part. This here is the highest cliff we have found in the solar system. It's about 12 miles high. Imagine standing at the top of that and looking down. If you could even, uh, on Earth, you might not even be able to see the bottom with the mist and so on. Of course, there's no atmosphere here to obscure your view. Now, if you were a secular model or trying to explain how just the laws of physics produce such a thing, um, this would be a real challenge. I mean, look, again, look how distinct the different segments, the different uh, parts of Miranda are. It almost looks like a big patchwork quilt that someone took different pieces and glued them all together. Well, this creates a problem, doesn't it? And when there's a problem, you need, as you probably know by now, a solution. Uh, some people propose that Miranda formed looking a little more conventional, and then something crashed into it, broke it up into pieces, and the pieces reformed in the moon that we see today. Other people point out that one collision wouldn't be enough, and uh, NASA used to have a webpage up that proposed five collisions in a row. So there was a collision, breakup, reform, collision, breakup, reform, five cycles of that to actually explain the moon that we see. Still, other people have pointed out, though, that maybe a collision isn't even a viable explanation anyway, because it's doubtful as to whether such dramatic terrain features like we see here would survive even one collision, never mind up to five. So the effort today is that there's tidal effects going on inside of the moon and there's material coming up and it still is a real challenge, as you can imagine, trying to explain how this thing got there looking the way that it does. Moving outwards, we come to the planet Neptune, which is on the outer edge of our solar system. Uh, now, being so far away, if you were on Neptune looking toward the sun, the sun would appear to be not much more than a, uh, a close-by star. Neptune does not receive much energy from the sun, and since it's supposedly been there for four and a half billion years, second, the modelers expected this to be an old, cold, and dead planet. There shouldn't be much happening way out there. Turns out that this isn't true. We have actually seen uh, large storm systems, like some of these spots that you see here, We've seen them appear and disappear just in the few decades that we've had the ability to observe it closely. So ne Neptune has a lot of activity going on. In fact, it's a very dynamic planet. It actually has the strongest winds in its atmosphere ever measured in the solar system, 1,300 miles per hour. Very dynamic, very active place, not old, cold, and dead after all. It also has a really interesting moon named Triton, which we have recently found out is geologically active. And this is a similar problem that we saw in Enceladus. 
this object should have cooled off billions of years ago if it were actually billions of years old. It shouldn't be geologically active anymore because that activity makes it look very young. Looking at Uranus and Neptune together, they actually share a common problem in that neither planet actually exists according to the secular model, or at least they shouldn't. As this uh, article in Astronomy Magazine pointed out, psst, astronomers who model the formation of the solar system have kept a dirty little secret. Uranus and Neptune don't exist. For at least computer simulations have never explained how planets as big as the two gas giants could form so far from the sun. Basic problem is this far out in the solar system, there's, uh, things are orbiting very slowly. And so there's a not enough time for an, the planetesimals to interact and gather and coalesce into planets out there. Uh, calculations show that you need 10 billion years of planet building to account for planets this far out in the solar system. Of course, even the secular folks, uh, their model says four and a half billion. So they're more than five billion years short of the time necessary to explain planets out there. Not to mention the fact that there's no planetesimals out there anymore anyway to build anything from. So a straightforward uh, look at these planets and the implications of the model would say that these planets shouldn't actually exist. Now people are suggesting that these planets actually formed elsewhere in the solar system and then migrated outwards against the sun's gravity. And these explanations have gotten fairly complicated over time in an effort to try to explain how these planets could actually even be there. Skipping forward a little bit. On the even farthest edge of our solar system is the former planet <laughs> named Pluto. Here's Pluto, Pluto and its moon, Charon. Lots of interesting things have been discovered about Pluto recently. Uh, this being such a tiny little world, it was assumed that this, this too would certainly be old, cold, and dead, that when the New Horizon spacecraft arrived a few years ago, it wouldn't really find uh, much going on on this little world. But actually, there is a lot going on here. Uh, notice this large region of smooth terrain toward the bottom of this photo. Pluto is actually covered in smooth, I shouldn't say covered, it, as parts of its surface have smooth craterless terrain, large expanses of terrain with no craters on them. Well, what does no craters mean? It means that surface is very young because there hasn't been enough time for things to hit Pluto and make craters. So when you see a smooth surface, like here on the right, you say that's very young terrain. Notice, however, on this one photo on the left, there are some craters. On the right, there's none. And then in the middle, there's some craters that are partially filled in. So it seems that there were some craters there previously. And then Pluto's equivalent of volcanic activity happened and flooded the surface and filled in the craters and smoothed out whatever terrain was there before. So in other words, uh, the surface has been reworked and very recently, because as I said, this terrain is very young. Now, if you look this up, you'll be told that the terrain is up to 10 million years old. Uh, uh, that's the 10 million number doesn't really mean much of anything. This could have happened the week before our spacecraft got there for all we can tell. I mean, it's totally fresh. I think this is more an issue of secular astronomers can't bring themselves to use words like thousands of years in their proposed explanations. But again, that question arises. So this geological activity happened very recently whether it was weeks or years or hundreds or even thousands of years ago, it's very recent. Um, and that means Pluto it has been geologically active very recently. It may even still be active today, as some secular folks have admitted. What is the source of heat for this geological activity? Well, there's a few possible sources of heat that could do this, um, but two of the three don't work for Pluto. Uh, number one is radioactive decay. Uh, that can produce heat, but the problem is Pluto is not very dense. We've measured that. And so it can't have much radioactive material inside of it because radioactive elements are very heavy. Nor can it be tidal heating uh, as an explanation because Pluto isn't experiencing any tidal heating. Unlike uh, Enceladus and Io and, uh, and Triton, that possible explanation is not available here. It didn't really work with the others anyway, but here it's not even an option. So the only reasonable option here is that this is primordial heat, heat left over from Pluto's formation. The problem is, if that was billions of years ago, this primordial heat would have dissipated billions of years ago. Pluto is a tiny little world, can't hold on to its heat, and the fact that it still has some would indicate that it is very young. And the last thing I'll talk about in my time here is comets. Um, we're going to kind of go through this quickly. Comets are big, dirty snowballs in space. Uh, this is the Vilt 2 comet. It's about three miles across, so that gives you an indication of roughly how big these things are. And for most of their history, most of their time in space, these are not very exciting things because they're small, they're dark, 
They don't reflect sunlight. They don't make any light of their own. Um, but once they approach the sun, the sun heats them up. The ices within them start to sublimate into gas. Those gases come out as jets and form the tails that we sometimes can see from Earth if it's a, if it's a good comet. And some of them are duds and we don't get to see much, but some of them are, are really beautiful. But this means that every time a comet approaches the sun, it loses material. And when it does that enough times, it'll break up into pieces. And we've actually seen this happen with a few dozen comets now. Now, some comets will avoid this happening only because they crash into the Jupiter or the sun first, or they get flung out of the solar system completely. But either way, when you see a comet, especially a short period comet, which uh, comes back to the sun again and again frequently, it is doomed to destruction. It's not going to last very long. How long can a short period comet last, given what we know about uh, how much material they lose and so on? The answer is about 10,000 years. So if a short period comet, um, I was gonna say if it's older than 10,000 years, but it doesn't get older than 10,000 years because it, it'll be destroyed first. The origins question here is that the secular model can only account for comets forming at the beginning of the solar system's history. They can only form when the solar system did. So therefore, if the solar system were more than 10,000 years old, we wouldn't see short period comets anymore. But we do still see short period comets today. This is an indication that the solar system is less than 10,000 years old. Now, secular modelers try to explain this by saying there's this big reservoir of comets out in space that keeps resupplying them. There's actually a lot of problems with that, and I won't bore you with details. I will just note that this is indeed a problem for secular modelers. So to review our solar system, where did it come from? Well, we looked at all of the various objects within it briefly. There's more we could say, um, but I have one hour to do all this. We talked about the solar nebula model, that it makes certain predictions, and that we can look at the various things in our solar system and see that they are actually inconsistent with the model in some important ways. There's evidence for design in many of these objects, and many of them do not look billions of years old. There's strong reasons to believe that these objects are young, instead of being the billions of years old that the model requires. They also provide a good perspective on scientific truth, quote unquote. Uh, you often hear the phrase, we need to go rewrite the textbooks because everything we thought we knew turns out to not be correct. Well, that should also give us some perspective on relying on the information in the current generation of textbooks especially when those make claims that contradict the Bible, because whatever claims they're making today may be disproven tomorrow. And actually, they disprove the Bible, and if science correctly discovers truth, they will be discarded eventually because the Bible contains truth. So if the textbook contradicts it, then the textbook is wrong. What's the bottom line of all this? Well, one of my astrophysics textbooks actually says, thus far we have seen that we know very little about the development of the solar system. And I like that quote because at least the author is showing a little humility here rather than making claims about how we absolutely know something when in fact we don't. Because the heavens did not come as a result of gas clouds. The heavens actually declared the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. So a correct understanding of the solar system will support that account. So that brings my presentation to a conclusion. Uh, my website is creationastronomy.com. If you like this type of perspective on astronomy, then there's a free newsletter available there to you. Uh, there's a sign up form on the homepage. This only comes out a few times a year currently. I'd like to do it more often and I hope to in the future. But my point is you won't be spammed with endless email messages. It'll only arrive occasionally. Also on that site, uh, you'll see there's some DVDs available for sale. The presentation you just saw was actually excerpted from the first of this three volume series. Uh, the full presentation has even more information on the planets and some other moons that I didn't even have a chance to talk about today. Uh, what I want to mention to you right now, though, is also on the site if, at this particular page, www.creationastronomy.com slash volume one, uh, you see there's a video I've recently published on Pluto. It's a, uh, 11 minutes long, more information on Pluto than what I had time to talk about today. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, maybe take a photograph of the screen with your phone or something. I will also post this link into the chat box, actually, so you, if you don't get it now, you can get it later. That concludes my time, and thank you all again for your attention. And I will turn it over to Dr. Locklear, if he's there. I am here. Excellent, Spike. Thank you very much. You received a number of comments about how clear and understandable your presentation was. There are a number of questions. I just, I'm just going to throw one of these questions at you, if you don't mind. Okay. According to secular astronomy, the elements used to form our planet were formed in distant exploded supernovas. Is there any evidence that this mechanism could create enough matter to form our solar system? 
Uh, the question as phrased says enough matter, but the first part of the question seems to be talking about the makeup and composition of the matter. I'm not really sure where the question's going. Yeah, I, I think it's the whole question of nucleosynthesis. Uh, if we grant that the distant stars can make other elements, is it reasonable to assume that enough other elements could reach us from in order to form the matter here? Uh, it, it's a good question, and there's actually several aspects to it. I, I like to focus on the broader picture of this rather than the, discussing the intricacies of nucleosynthesis, uh, whether it's in, you know, within fusion within a star or supernova explosions or whatever. The broader picture of the secular outlook on things starts with the Big Bang almost 14 billion years ago. The Big Bang only made energy, which condensed into matter, which supposedly formed stars, which then, you know, planets out of the gas clouds and so on. That being the case, heavier elements did not exist in the earlier universe, because if you look at the model, the Big Bang could make hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium, and maybe a little bit of beryllium, and that's basically it. So the secular modelers have to explain all the other elements as being the result, as the question said, of nucleosynthesis and other processes. Uh, if this were true, then the very first generation of stars, you know, before any nucleosynthesis had happened yet, the very first generation of stars would be made of just hydrogen and helium and maybe a little bit of lithium, and that would be it, because that's all that all the, there was in the universe, allegedly. That generation of stars is called population three stars. Now, most of those would have been large and hot and burned out um, over a period of time. Some of those, however, should still exist today if this model were true. So the broader picture of the first generation of stars, the population three stars, only making, only having hydrogen and helium and maybe lithium and beryllium. Uh, and then as they burned and then they exploded, that made other elements that were then incorporated into the next generation of stars, which made elements which are incorporated in the broader universe, et cetera. The broader picture there breaks down because we haven't seen any population three stars. Uh, there should be a sizable number of them that still exist and they should be observable, but they're not there. So without, again, without getting into the details of nucleosynthesis and how all the matter got spread around, I like to focus on the big picture. That first generation of stars that's the beginning of this whole process is missing. So that's inconsistent with this way of looking at things. I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you. Thanks again, Spike. I think we should rename the uh, solar nebula hypothesis the asteroids of the gap idea. <laughs> right. <laughs>